Hi, I'm Adam, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Adam. I'm also an entrepreneur and an attorney. I'm the first attorney in my family. I'm not the first entrepreneur. We also have our fair share of alcoholics. And growing up, my parents ran a number of businesses. They had a used car dealership. They had a landscaping business. But most importantly, my parents had a car stereo shop. And this was in the 80s and 90s when car stereo shops were big business. And my dad was the Michael Jordan of car stereo installation. He won world records, set world records, won world championships, won national championships. People shipped their cars from overseas for him to put the stereos in them. So you're probably asking yourself, what was your childhood like? Can you guess, guess which one of those three guys is me? The, the guy whose dad owns a stereo shop has a sweet mullet with like the carving in the side of his hair, this stripy jacket. Let's, let's contrast that to the guy in front of me in line. His dad's a CPA. <laughs> he, he's, there, he's there in like his starched blue shirt. Uh, he's grown up now. He's a very successful insurance salesman. All of her, his student loans are paid off. Uh, needless to say, my upbringing was a, a little bit different. So when I went on to college, I started at the University of Michigan. I transferred back to Behrend, uh, and I started my own business. I started a house painting business. We called it Painting 101 and I employed some other uh, college students to work for me and, and paint. And I remember a time I was sitting in a public speaking class at Behrend during a summer, because I had to catch up on credits. And while I was sitting in class, I had two different painting crews at two different locations in the city making me money while I was sitting in class. And that felt pretty freaking good. <laughs> but I didn't want to paint houses for the rest of my life. So I went on to the University of Pittsburgh, I got my law degree, I got my MBA, and then finally, after seven and a half years of college, <laughs> my wife told me to get a job. <laughs> so I took a shot at the corporate America thing, uh, I got a job with a big four accounting firm. I worked in the tax department, worked with some great people, but corporate America was not for me. I lasted at that job 366 days, because I had to stay a year to keep my signing bonus. So I left, I moved back to Erie with my wife, I got a job clerking for a trial court judge, did that for about a year, and then I decided it was time to start my own law practice. I, sh I should go out on my own. And growing up in the family I grew up in, being around entrepreneurs my whole life, running my own business, I've read every book there is on how to start a business. And chapter one of every book on how to start a business says you need a good accountant and you need a good lawyer. And I am that lawyer. I represent startup businesses, I represent established businesses. A couple of months ago, I signed a fee agreement with a billion dollar company. Billion, with a B. So, I'm kind of a big shot. <laughs> but my favorite clients are the ones who brew beer for a living. And here's how far I'm willing to go for these guys. I will meet them after hours. I will meet them at their location. I will get to know their staff. You're obviously all reading between the lines. I go there for happy hour, and that's when we do the real legal work. But I wanna, I wanna tell you about one of these guys that I do a lot of work with, because his startup story, which is very interesting to me, if we change the names, you could tell the same exact story in hundreds of other cities across America. So I'll tell you about my friend Chris Siriani. 15 years ago, Chris opened up a brew pub in Erie, Pennsylvania, easily 10 years ahead of his time when he did this. And Chris had spent about two years preparing for this, writing his business plan, getting funding together, and traveling the country and talking to other brewers to learn how to do this well on his own. And when he finally opened his brew pub, it's in this super cool old train station that they've renovated. And Chris decided that he, as part of his mission and his vi vision for his business, was gonna do community building. What's that mean? They have fundraisers for nonprofits. They have craft beer festivals. They have homebrew festivals. And again, if you're reading between the lines, he's just getting all of his brewing buddies together and they're drinking. But he calls it community building, so we're gonna run with that. So the one event that they do, they call the Brewers Cup. And homebrewers will come in, it's a competition, the public is invited, and there are winners there aren't losers, I mean it's beer, but there are winners, they give away awards. And there's a, there's a young man by the name of Jason Lavery who had a lot of success at this event. 
And he was winning year after year. And eventually he went to Chris, who was hosting this event and said, hey, I think I wanna start my own brewery, but it's really expensive. Can I use your equipment to do that? And, and think about what Jason is asking for. Think about if Tesla Motors went to General Motors and said, hey guys, we're starting our own car company, but it's really expensive. Can we use your stuff? It's kind of a joke, but Chris said yes. Chris agreed to let a competitor start up in his shop. And interestingly, the laws in Pennsylvania allow this. They, they, for brewers, they have what's called an alternating proprietorship. So one brewery can shut down for the day, another one can come in and, and use the equipment. So for a couple of years, Jason was brewing beer in Chris's brewery. He'd pay him in kegs every month. And after a couple of years, Jason outgrew that location. He started up his own brew pub practically across the street, is outgrowing that location, and is traveling the country with his beers winning awards. So we've got a guy who started a brewery, took the risk, and incubated a competitor. And like I said, if we changed those names, you'd hear that same story in a lot of other cities in America. So what are these guys working on now? Well, there are about 10 craft breweries in Erie right now. More than half of them started at um, the brewing competition at, at Chris's Brewery, more than half of them. And last year during American Craft Beer Week, we of course had Erie Craft Beer Week, and these guys had a collaborative release. They created a beer called the 814 Pear Ale, and eight different breweries put their logos on that beer. And again, think about that. Think about the car example. If you bought a car with eight different manufacturers on it, that's, that's weird, man. But these, these guys make it work. So the next step for this, these guys, the next thing that they're doing is called the Lake Erie Ale Trail. They all got together and they said, hey, we, we brew really good beer. We're all in really close geographic proximity to each other. Why don't we make this a draw for tourists and for people out in the community? So they got together and did exactly that. And when I heard about this, when I heard about the Lake Erie Ale Trail, that reminded me of a concept that I learned about in economics courses that I had during my illustrious college career. And the concept is called the network economy. And this is a topic that is absolutely glazed over in economics courses because it's a very easy topic to understand. The idea behind a network economy is that the more users there are of a technology, the more value that it, there is to each of those users. And the example that they give is the telephone. So when I was in school, they said, imagine if there was one telephone, it's worthless. You can't call anybody. If there are 100 telephones, kind of useful. Now we've got billions of telephones all over the world. And if you hit the right combination of keys, you can get a hold of just about anybody. And we overlook it, but that's really valuable uh, if you think about it and take time to appreciate it. What's interesting now, though, is telephones were the example when I was in school, but think about what's happened recently. Email accounts, Facebook accounts, Twitter users all benefit from the network economy. How about Tinder, the dating app? What if there were only two people on there? That would be kind of weird. But Tinder's got millions of users, and it's a, it's a very useful dating app or so I'm told. <laughs> so if we think about what these brewers are doing and the way that they're working together, it's a little different from what we think about and what we hear about when we think about traditional capitalists and economics people, economists, and, and, and business people. Because the traditional mindset the mindset that comes to us from Adam Smith, the father of modern economics, and Milton Friedman, is that if I'm acting in my own best interest, if I'm maximizing my own utility, I'm doing the most for, for society as a whole. And this isn't an uncommon thing. I mean, it, it works in the business world. Larry Ellison, the founder of Oracle, at one point the wealthiest man in the world, was famous for saying, and wrote a book about, in order for me to succeed, everyone else must fail. But what are these brewers saying? They're saying, you know, if one of us succeeds, it's a lot more likely that the rest of us are gonna succeed. So let's, let's think about how this works for a minute. And let's, let's think about if this works in other industries that aren't the tech industries that I mentioned with the network economy. Let's talk about wineries and vineyards. If you go to Napa Valley, California, or the Finger Lakes in New York, or Northeast Pennsylvania, you can pick up a map 
and have a handful of wineries, sometimes a lot more than a handful, listed on a map, and you can travel around and see these places. These people are working together to create a draw and to create more utility for their consumers. How about food trucks? It's not very often you see one food truck parked on the corner. Normally, you see a group of them out there with not necessarily competitive offerings, but complementary offerings. So if I pick up something from this place, maybe I'll get dessert over here, or I'll come back tomorrow for something from this food truck. So these guys are making it work by working together. So we've got wineries, a growing market. We've got um, food trucks, a growing industry. Beer is slow growing, but craft beer is the fastest growing segment of that industry every year, year after year for the last several years. So we've got the network idea, the, the idea of collaboration, and we've got growing markets. But I'm not really convinced that there's a causal relationship there. It may be more of a correlation, more of a coincidence. So let's think about how the network can work in a dying industry. And one of the more antiquated business models I can think of is home video stores. There's no need for home video stores. I can stream high definition content to my cell phone. I can download it to my TV, watch 5.1 stereo surround, and you know I have a kick-ass subwoofer in my living room. I don't need a video store. But the video store in my neighborhood, the family video, is packed every Friday and Saturday night. So what have they done? Well, they've got a network of stores all across the region. They've got a number of locations. And immediately next to the video store, they put a pizza place. And the wall between the two was removed. When you go and pick up your pizza, you can walk into the video store and pick up your videos. They are using their network of stores and growing in a dying industry. And then when you're done with the videos, you call the pizza place, they deliver your pizza, and return your movie for you. Awesome. <laughs> so it's working in a lot of areas. But let's get back to the microbrewers, the, the craft brewers. What they're doing is what Larry Ellison wants, the, the pure capitalistic business person. They're achieving what he wants. He's still one of the richest people in the world, but you know where I'm going with this. Larry Ellison, at the end of the day, really wants control over consumers. He wants consumer loyalty. Do the craft brewers have it? Well, think about when Budweiser runs an ad during the Super Bowl making fun of fruity peach ales, and there is outrage in the craft beer community. They're going to boycott Budweiser and all of the craft beer breweries that they own because now they're being attacked. So we've got consumer loyalty, not necessarily to one firm, but to the idea, the industry of, of craft brewers. What about control over competitors and potential competitors? Well, think about if you're going to start a craft brewery and you're not going to team up with the other guys who are out there working together, you're facing a pretty big uphill battle. So what these guys are achieving by working together, by collaborating, by using their network, is they're creating the new monopoly. So let's go back to chapter one of the book. You need a good accountant. You need a good lawyer. But maybe you also need the right competitors. And maybe you should take one of them out for a beer. Cheers. Do I go?